This is an interview with John Homan at the Hampton Inn, Newburgh, New York, January 8th, 2003, approximately 9 a.m. The interviewers are Michael Russert and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you tell me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? John K. Homan, July 11th, 1930, Newburgh, New York. Okay, what was your education before you entered the service? My education was only up to the 10th grade. Uh, and then my dad had a bad fall, and uh, things were hard back then. So I didn't go back to school. I went to work, and it was nice making a little money. And then I joined the Marine Corps in 1949. And, so, uh, you enlisted in the Marine Corps? I enlisted in the Marine Corps in, uh, in August of 1949, went to Paris Island. Okay, could you tell me first, well, why did you select the Marine Corps? Because the Navy wouldn't take me. They said my teeth didn't come together. And it sounds silly, but the guy said my teeth didn't come together, and if I was aboard ship, I would sink with the hose in my mouth. So, I don't think they had needed the quota. So, I went down the hall, and the Marines signed me up, and, mm -hmm. and that was the rest of history. Okay, where did you... Uh, from there, we went to uh, Albany, New York, and we got sworn in up there. And I went in with a buddy that I went to school with. I didn't even know he was listing. Frank Crystal was his name. And uh, we went up together, and as I walked in before him, uh, the captain says, Private Holman, you're going to be in charge of Private Crystal. And I've held that over him for the last three and a half years <laughs> that we were in the service together. But... Uh, uh, he just passed away about two years ago. He was really b banged up bad. He was a lineman in Korea up at the Chosen. He got lost from his outfit and, uh, and he had some bad problems. I finally got him signed up for compensation disability. He received a couple of checks of a 70% disability, which I'm receiving right now, going toward 100% disability for my face. All these years everybody thought I had high blood pressure, but it's frostbite from Korea. Also, the loss of the hair on my legs, that's from frostbite. And I, I get 40% post-traumatic stress. I still have nightmares after 52 years. So. And uh, so in the Marine Corps, we were on a med cruise. We land, left in May of 1950 out of Norfolk, Virginia, aboard the USS Wooster Light Cruiser 144. And then and, uh, near the end of September, uh, oh, I'm sorry, October, we were shanghaied over into Kobe, Japan, where we met up with the 1st Marine Division and made the Incheon landing in September. And then from there it was through. Okay, um, why don't we go back a little bit. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> could you describe the Incheon land landing? It was rough. We were, the, I think, we were the second group to go in. And, uh, of course, the once we landed at Incheon, my buddy that was alongside of me all through boot camp, and he was going to be a doctor when he got out, he got hit. You couldn't stop to pick him up. You had to keep on going. And then they had a big wall there, which we had to try to climb over with some ladders, homemade ladders. Got in there in Inchon, secured that, and then from there we fought our way up to Seoul. And uh, the rest is all in my book. I have, I, made, I kept a little address book, and I wrote things down as we went along. Probably if I got caught, they probably would have terrorized me more, or whatever you want to call it. But I finally took it out of the book and wrote it on three or four pages of every place I was and the time and so forth. And Were you allowed to keep diaries? Well, they didn't know it. I, I don't think they. It was just a little address uh -huh. book, and I just kept writing on the pages. And, uh, and then finally I transferred it onto paper, uh -huh. and it's in my scrapbook. I have. I started three scrapbooks uh, since I, my mother used to be very thank, uh, thankful for me for, I thank her rather for saving all the papers that I sent home. Anything I could pick up, I sent home, she saved them. <clears throat> the other scrapbook that I originally started is so fallen apart, so I've taken things out of it and made new ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, Did you write often? I wrote all the time. Mm -hmm. Did she keep your letters? <laughs> she too? kept my letters, but they got lost someplace. And uh, um, what do I want to say? 
My mother's birthday was on Christmas, and I was always sending a cake to no matter where I was, so I sent a $5 script home to the bake shop in Newburgh, and they couldn't accept it because it was worthless back here. So they took and made the cake and delivered it, and I got that picture in the paper where the bake shop was delivering the cake. It says, Marine uh, remembers mother's birthday from Foxhole in Korea. So I made the front page in a local paper. And I've been uh, having a couple other interviews. I've done a couple of stories a few years ago and uh, made the record and made the Sentinel in New Windsor on articles about me over in Korea. Um, could you tell me your unit? I was in Howe Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division. When we left, when we left Paris Island, or I mean Camp Lejeune rather, from Camp Lejeune I was in the 2nd second, second Marines and then of course we joined up in Kobe, Japan with the 1st Marines and then made the landing. Mm -hmm. But that was my outfit, H-37. Um, how would you rate your training? Well, <clears throat> this was back in 1949. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit, I think, easier today when I look at some of the Paris Island boot camp stories and, you know, videos. I, I've got a couple of them. The training looks a little harder, but I, we still went through a good training, too, with the gas chamber and out in the fields and the marches. Back then, we lost a few men that were, got caught in the swamp and never made it out. And, uh, but they still do it today, too. But... Uh, uh, I had good training, had very good training, and we graduated, the class graduated, and uh, from Paris Island I would come home, then I went to Camp Lejeune, and uh, stayed there until uh, I saw a notice on the board about a med cruise, and everybody said, you ought to take one. You get all this, uh, see the world and everything on the government, so I, I signed up, and then another guy said, why don't you take mess duty? Because once you're on mess duty, you get free liberty wherever you want to go, you know, and when the port, when the ports. But they put me in a bad position. They had me down cleaning the garbage. <laughs> and I had, to go, I had to go through it with a rubber glove and a big stick, pick out the silverware. So I never did make much liberty in some of the ports, but I did get to France and Italy and Portugal. And, uh, and as I say, then Truman got us out and shipped us over to Kobe, Japan. And then uh, when I came home, I was stationed up in Scotia, New York, Navy Supply Base, just up nearby Schenectady. I don't know if you know of it. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. It's, it's all out of there now. And uh, I became Staff Sergeant there. I was Corporal when I left Korea. And, uh, and my buddy Frank Crystal came in about two months after I was there. We had gone in together, and we got discharged together. So that was something I'll always cherish. Yeah, let's um, go back to Korea. You said you <clears throat> were involved from Incheon up to Seoul. Right, right up to Incheon, Seoul. Uh, I was at Pusan, Wonsan, that evacuation of the 100,000 people. I was with that one. And then when we got up to the Chosen Reservoir up near uh, the Chinese border, and that's when we got trapped. There was only a single road going up. It was 30 below zero. Wind chill was like 100. You couldn't make fires, because if you did, then they would spot you. And the Chinese would always attack late at night. And we sent flares up, and we look out there in the field, and here they come, hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, once the flares died down, you can't see them then. And uh, one night I heard my buddy screaming, and I didn't dare yell. They told you, don't yell, because I give your position away. And the next morning I saw him, he got stabbed right in a sleeping bag. So I, I feel lucky, very lucky. Um, how well were you equipped? How, how would you rate your winter equipment? At first it was a little hard. It, it took a while for us to get full equipment. Uh, the main part we were always worried about was our feet. They always told us to try to keep us feet as dry as possible. We had the parkas finally. They, they sent the heavy parkas in. And the trouble with the sleeping bags was that the zippers would freeze up and they couldn't get them down at night time. That's why a lot of guys lost their lives because they couldn't get out of their sleeping bag. Uh, we had good heavy gloves. Uh, our underwear was, was good, uh, but the socks were the worst of the whole thing. At night, if you could, 
put our little ponchos up and try to get in where it was a little warm. We try to take them off and wring them out, and then we would put them in be between our shirt and our body to dry them as best we could. And that's, I think, what saved a lot of them. But mm -hmm. I have Did you, you didn't have extra socks with you, or we had we only had about two pair. That's mm -hmm. all. And we the underwear we hadn't changed in three or four months, five months. We haven't changed our underwear because no place to go. We we're always on the go, and there was no no tents or buildings, no showers, and uh, so it made it kind of hard at that point. And uh, I ended up with frostbite in my toes, and I just found out in November at the VA up in Albany that uh, that is frostbite on my face, and I lost some of my hair and my legs, and my fingers are starting to crack and bleed from the cold weather. I can't take the cold weather, and. Uh, but uh, I'm just thankful that after 72 years I am that I can be around to talk about some of it. And I never talked to my children about it. And my second wife here, Dora, she's a nurse, retired nurse. And when she went with me one year up to Albany, she told the doctor, she said, that this gentleman twitches and he turns and he's talking in his sleep all the time. And still I get visions of what I've, I've seen and, you know, over there. One of the articles in one of the papers shows where I uh, went out to try to save my staff sergeant and uh, pulled him back in and then I got the bronze star from Colonel Litzenberg on the 38th parallel and that's all documented there too when I when I did it so I kept a little record of what did you receive the bronze star for for saving his life he was pinned down under fire and I went out and drive him back in and then the next day we went out on a patrol now, was this in the Chosen? This is up at the ch up near the Chosen. When I got back, he uh, he wasn't with us, so they sent another patrol out, and I found him standing up by a tree with a bullet between his between his head there and the eyes. And he, they had turned his pockets inside out and took his boots off of him. And uh, it, that's a memory I I always have. Um, and there's other incidents too that I've seen along the road with all the the bodies are in the ditch, our, our people. We couldn't get them out because we had to keep moving. And uh, these things, you know, just keep striking me back all the time. I get very emotional. And uh, But uh, as I say, it was something I had to do. And look out for yourself. That was the main thing. And uh, also your buddy. And that's why you, you, know, you always kept a buddy system in. The two of us would be together, and one look after the other while one's resting, the other's keeping watch. And so that's what I say. I think helped save a lot of our lives over there. But we did lose an awful lot, and there's still more missing. General Davis just went back over to Korea. He's a Medal of Honor winner, mm -hmm. and uh, he just went back over and went up by the Chosen Reservoir and took a plaque up there, I guess, and placed it up there by the Chosen for the. Our group it's called the Chosen Few. They organized, I think, in 1984. I don't know if I'm going off the stuff. No, that's okay. They, they, they organized, I think it was back in 1984 or 5, but I didn't know about it until 1991 when my daughter took me down to see her friend of hers and her father came out with a hat on and said, The Chosen Few. And I said, That says Korea. And he said, Yeah. I said, I was there. So he gave me an application. I filled it out in 91. Went to New Orleans for my first reunion, and I met, I would say, about eight or nine fellows from my outfit down here, plus the colonel, who I was his runner at that time. He was a lieutenant, and uh, we had a nice reunion at the dinner that night. And uh, after that, in 95, I went down to the big parade in Washington for the dedication of the monument. You ever been down there to see that? No, I haven't, I haven't I seen it. You, you have I seen a Korean, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Well, we live in Newburgh, and they had all the monuments made in Beacon, New York, mm -hmm. over yeah, at Tart. Yeah, a, so yeah. my wife and I went over, and I took pictures of it all. I got them in here of the one that they were being made, and oh, then yeah. when they took them down and transferred them to Washington, D.C., we were there that morning when they were taken away in the truck. So I had a set made, and I sent it to General Davis, because I thought he would like that because he was on that committee. Mm -hmm. He sent me his book of his life story of General Davis. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but it's it's quite a history of, of General a Medal of Honor winner. Mm -hmm. And I also now belong to two chapters of the Chosen Few, one Northeast chapter of Albany, New York, New York, and a New England chapter. 
that covers Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, all over there. I, uh, I am also a member of the Marine Corps League, and at this time I'm the Commandant. I, I'm the chaplain of the Albany group up there, and in the New England chapter I'm just, just a member. So it keeps me busy. I'm also a member of the Korean War veterans up in Albany. I joined that group up there. I was with the American Legion. It's a wonderful outfit, but it just, uh, I couldn't, I had to give up something, and that was one of the things. I, I shouldn't say that, but I had to give it up because the you American can't Legion. You can't say it with everything. No, I know. But, um, uh, can I ask you a, question, a couple of questions? Yes. How, do you, how do you feel about your overall military experience? How do you think it affected your life? Well, um, I think it's something every young man, when he goes into the service, doesn't know what he's expecting. But when you come out of boot camp, you're a man. And, uh, and you do whatever the government's going to tell you to do. There's nothing else you can do about it. You have to do what they tell you. And uh, when I got home, I was only... 21, and uh, I felt felt pretty good. I felt pretty good. I didn't have no injuries. I was thankful for that. It was a close call, which I still have the the bullet home that landed on my Parker's ricocheted off a rock and landed. I, I'm thankful for that. That it wasn't for meant for me. I met a lot of good guys, which I still correspond with after all these years. The worst part was when I got back. I tried to get a job. Because I didn't finish school, they wouldn't accept me at the telephone company in Newburgh. They said I had to have a high school diploma. And I said, well, I've been away for three and a half years. I just got my high school diploma last month at the high school after operation recognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just presented my diploma from the NFA in Newburgh. Thank you. So that part there, and I, as I say, I got married. I had three children. And uh, when I went to the first physical, the doctor said, why are you waiting all these years to come to us now? I said, because I didn't realize there was an organization from the Chosen Reservoir. So when I heard about this, I went to the VA and I applied for disability and compensation, which at that time they didn't give me hardly anything. I think it was like 20%. And uh, so finally, after another visit, they increased my disability for post-traumatic stress and my feet for the frostbite. But now I'm going into... Did your feet ever bother you when yeah, you came back? Yeah, yeah, they were bothering me, but I didn't know what it was. You know, I'm only a young guy. I'm only 21 years old. I got married, raised a family. But as I got older, all these things start setting in, and this is what happened to most of our veterans. Uh, nothing happened while we were young, but as we got older, it was affecting our body. And I have another fella I just met a couple of days ago, and him and I were down in Barris Island, and he was in Korea, but he wasn't up at the Chosen, but he was up in that area where it was cold. He's having a lot of problems with his, with his legs, and I said, did you ever apply? He says, no, I go to the VA for treatment. I said, that's not what you got to do. you got to go in and see the girl for disability compensation. You're a Korean veteran. Uh, this is an organization, of what I belong to now, the Chosen. We are all members that were up at the Chosen Reservoir and fought our way back down at 14 miles, okay. or 14 days we're up there, and then come down 76 miles to the sea. And, uh, but I said to him, Yuggy, that's what they call him, Yuggy, I said, you're entitled to something. You ought to tell the girl over there you want to go to Albany and be examined. So I got to give him the phone number and have him call the girl. How about, um, what were your relationships with uh the Korean population and the Korean soldiers, did you have much contact with the... Not too much because uh, the language barrier, mm -hmm. that would be number one. Um, and of course we didn't know whether they were South Koreans or North Koreans, that's what was a hard thing to distinguish. So when we were going through villages, we had to watch all ways mm -hmm. because when we were aboard ship before we left to go there, they were showing pictures of the first part of the action when it started how in the summertime they had hay fields out in the field and their soldiers would go by, Marines or Army, whatever they were, and then they would open up fire on them. They had a machine gun inside the stack. Mm -hmm. And then we went through the villages and went into houses 
the women would be sitting over in a corner, curdled, all curdled up or huddled up there. With, they looked big, you know, and they had their children underneath their dresses. They were afraid we were going to shoot them. But we didn't know what we were getting into. I mean, we just had to search the, the homes as we were going along. And uh, so that was very scary, very scary. Did you ever have any contact with, uh, since this was the first time the Army and the Marines were integrated with blacks? No. No, we had we had five five or six blacks in our group. In fact, I got a picture of shows from standing there. A few of them, we got along fine. Mm -hmm. No no problems of integration or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we all fought together for one thing: to get our job done and get home. Mm -hmm. Like Truman's or not Truman MacArthur said, "We'll all be home by Christmas." Well, Christmas I was in behind a big hill. We we're having our Christmas dinner in cardboard boxes and and whatever else we could find to eat it. and It was hot, you know, it was a hot meal, but we were under fire. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to be home by Christmas, so. Um, what was your reaction to, well, how about the Chinese Army? What did you think of them as an opponent when you finally did? I, I think most of the Chinese Army, I think these, they're all young, very young, these kids were. And they were hardly dressed. I don't know how they could take the weather. I guess maybe because they were used to the cold weather where they lived. But they didn't have the equipment like we did, and that's why as soon as they killed one of our men, or whatever they did, they would strip them down, take their coats, take their boots, because they didn't have boots. They had their feet wrapped with burlap. Uh, and most of what I saw were younger, younger men. Uh, I would say I was only 20, mm -hmm. but I say these fellows look like 17, 18 years old. They're very young looking. And, they just come and grows and grows. It was like, like, well, the paper said, and I got it from the thing, it was 120,000 Chinese against one division of Marines. We only had, you know, the odds were so bad. Uh, equipment was freezing over, you know, our rifles and BA. Were you continuously supplied with food and, and ammunition? Uh, we had rations, you know, and then if we had a, a break, they had the, they call them the gooks. They would carry up the hot food up on the mountain. I show pictures of that. I got some pictures of that where they carried them up. How they ever did it, I don't know. They must have backs made out of steel. And those things are heavy, and they would bring them up and set them down, and we'd get a hot meal out of that. But then again, I always wondered, can you trust them? You know what I mean? We didn't know if they were North Koreans or they're supposed to be South Koreans. <clears throat> they could have poisoned the whole, whole outfit. But, uh, no, we did get a few hot meals. The only part was our rations, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our rations were frozen. So most of the time we always carried one can inside our parker by our chest to get, get it heated up so you could eat it. Of course, the old beans and hot dogs were the most favorite. Mm -hmm. The chicken soup and stuff like that was just frozen so bad that you couldn't even enjoy it. But... Uh, once in a while, we get a chance when they were stopped along the road to take your can out and go over and put it by the Jeep or whatever in the tank and try to warm it up a little bit. But it, uh, it was all right. It was okay. How did you feel about the, what was your reaction to the relief of MacArthur? Well, I, everybody thought he had done a good job. Mm -hmm. But uh, when he pulled that statement about we'll all be home for Christmas, we knew it wasn't going to happen. So then I guess that a lot of a lot of us turned against them. But we had very good superior officers that led us through. Very good. Yeah. Um, you don't have to answer this one if you don't. Uh, how about the election of Eisenhower? Did you vote for Eisenhower, support Eisenhower? When, or did you not vote in that? Uh... I don't think, I, no, I don't think we voted in that yeah, one. In yeah, because we're, yeah, we didn't get no ballots yeah. or anything. No, I, I but he did well. He did very well, I thought, from all I read about him. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, who, who was your division commander at that point? Do you remember? Oh, I hope I'm saying it right. O Omar Smith? I think it was Omar Smith. I, I might have it in one of my uh, papers here who was a, but like I say at the time, 
Colonel Litzenberg, he had uh, one part of the Marine Division up there, Colonel Litzenberg. And then there was, uh, well, uh, General Davis, he was a colonel. He's a Medal of Honor winner. He was, he had a group. In fact, he had our group, H-37 and uh, Item 37, uh, that area like that. Uh, but I can't recall offhand who was the, the division. I just think at that time it wasn't important to us. I mean, yeah. it was more of, your more of our units that we were concerned about, you know. We, we lost a lot of men, and I lost one lieutenant, and then, when, then this other lieutenant came in, it was uh, Colonel, it was Lieutenant Newton, and I became his runner. And then when I got out in 90, what am I saying, 90, boy, 52, and then uh, found out, when we had this parade in 95 in Washington, he retired as a full colonel. Mm -hmm. So, How did you, uh, you and your fellow uh, Marines get along with replacements? Well... Were they welcomed uh, with those Oh yeah, they were welcome because when I, they come in, I mean, it was getting closer for us to get out. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was the next to the last one in my outfit to leave. Under fire we were when the lieutenant got over the radio. He said, home and you're going home. I said, oh boy, he says, I'm not putting my head up over this hill for nothing, Lieutenant. I said, I'm staying right down here low. And uh, then he says to me, you're going back to the command post with four other men. Now we had to go back through the village that we had come up through, and it's getting dark, and then we, we didn't know what was going to happen going down, just the four of us, and all we carried was our weapon. We left everything back up there. And uh, we got back to the CP group and the guy wasn't going to let us in because we didn't know the password. They had changed it. I said, wait a minute, after nine months over here, I just, I don't want to get shot now. I said, we just come back off a of patrol, I said, and then we're, we're supposed to come back here and finally let us in. And when I got over the into the CP group who was there was Lieutenant Newton and uh, he welcomed me. He, he came back down to the group. He had left our outfit and uh, Gave us some hot food and everything, and then we stayed there overnight in the tent. And then the next day, we went down, and got on the airplane, and went back down over to Kobe, Japan. So, yeah. Well, you were over there. Did you get any kind of uh, rest breaks or R and R? Or, you know, see oh yeah, USO yes. shows. Yeah, or no, like we that? had USO shows. Uh, we had some boxing uh, th th when it was good weather. Mm -hmm. when it was a good weather and. Uh, they did have a USO show, and I forget who was there, but I think it's written down who was there. I didn't get to see them because there were so many, you know, around the area. They brought in a truck and had a, made a stage and things like that. Uh, I did get to the USO uh, to have coffee and donuts. They have them there, and they played music, and you sit and chat. And I'm walking down the road in, I think it was Mason, going to the USO, and this tank comes up the road and stops and uh, opens up the turret, out jumps this little guy, he comes over, picks me up off the road and spins me around. I said, I thought the guy was crazy, you know. He took off his goggles and helmet, it was Joe Galindo from Newburgh that I had worked with in the jewelry store before I left. He spotted me walking the road. He says, jump in, John. He said, I gotta take it out. He was in ordinance. He put the tanks together and everything, they take them out and test them. Mm -hmm. He brings me back to their area went to his tent. He says, want a piece of fruit? He had a bowl of fruit on the table. He said, would you like some clean underwear? I said, yeah, that would be nice after five, six months. Took a shower. I said, you guys are really living. But it was so funny, and he's still around today. I see him every once in a while, to have this guy pick me out of the road, and I couldn't get over it. I had a picture taken, but I lost it, and I'm getting Joe. He says, God is. I've been trying to get me, make me one so I could have it, but, but that was a, one of the funny incidents. You answered most of the ones I was going to ask about uh, being involved with uh, friends or anything, any contacts with the war. Um, I'd just like to thank you for the interview. And, okay. uh, now, if you could show us some of your things and then we could... 
Well, first of all, I have a collection of hats. This is the New England chapter that I belong to. I mean, the Northeast chapter up in there. I have a few pins on there. It says Sewell, Inchon, Pusan, Frozen, and I'm chaplain of this organization. And the Bronze Stars over here, and this is the 1st Marine Division insignia here. I have about eight or nine different things on it, pins and all. And this is the... This is a New England chapter, the chosen few, the New England chapter. This is their hat we wear when we go. And I have the Marine Corps emblem and the pin in Korea. And this is the chosen few. This is the star that led us back over here. When they had it, there's a, a Christmas card we had one year it's about, this, about this star that led us out. This is the 50th. Why did you tell the story behind that? What do you mean the star that led well, you Well, I can't, I can't remember it all. I'd have to get it out of the album. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's hard to remember all the little words into it. But this is the 50th anniversary pin that the Korean government sent to all <coughs> veterans if you, you know, you had to sign a paper and put in your discharge. And they sent everybody one. This is my first album that I started after I got out and come back, 1950-53. My uh, boot camp picture from boot camp, and I'm over here, and I'm over here. Now is where, my, where is your friend from Newburgh? That Frank Crystal? Crystal, yes. Uh, you see him? Yeah, he's in there. Oh, boy. Well. I didn't circle him. That's okay. That's all right. He's over in this section someplace. Mm -hmm. This is the story that I was telling you about. Combat veteran remembers his mother on his birthday, and she's holding all my mail. There's what all the mail I, and my favorite Bible verse that I always had, and my stepdaughter just gave me a Marine Corps chain, mm -hmm. and on the back of it, for some reason, it had Philippians 4.13, for I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And I wrote that on all my letters to my mother. This is when I first came home from Korea. And these are some of the pictures of over there in Korea. These are over 52 years old. That's me standing in front of this, our tent. We had a tent there in the area. And as I was saying, uh, you can see, this is the lieutenant here. Uh, the book's falling apart. But you want to get back to that. I just want you to show, there are two or three black fellows in here, and we got along fine together. This is one of the, we're watching a fight. They had fights over there to, Give people something to do. Uh, let's see if I can find that. That was my first, my first wife when I got back home and got married. We were 41 years and we've been married to Dora now for 10 years. Oh, <laughs> I got to see if I can't fix this one. Oh, where'd I go? I know. If it ain't this one, it's the other one. You don't have that thing running, do you? Yes. Oh, that's all right. Don't, don't okay. worry about it. Don't worry. <laughs> this is a reunion in New Orleans when ours went down. How many reunions have you attended? Four. We, we've attended four, haven't we? Four of them. Let me see if I can find that in the other album. This is another one I started. And on the eighth day, God created the Marines. <laughs> this is when we went. <clears throat> and I was a singing cowboy aboard the, we went on a cruise out, out of Miami. You want to sing for us while you're turning the pages? <laughs> <laughs> From the halls of Montezuma. Should we? <laughs> <laughs> These are all things I've collected over the years. And here's what I'm talking about. The monuments that were made over in Beacon, New York, mm -hmm. that are down now in Washington, D.C. And uh, we went over and I took pictures of every, every figure at the Tartex uh, foundry in Beacon, New York. Is that your insignia collection right there? No, no. This belongs to this fellow here that we met when I was in uh, New Orleans, Bob Volkman. We went to his house in Pennsylvania, and this is his collection of pins. And this is a group that was there from the New England chapter, and I'm over here in the back, and there's Dora right here. 
we had a good turnout. Look at all these. I think it's kind of interesting yeah, to see the, the uh, figures. Yeah, they're, these are all. They, they're, if you'll notice, they're all on steel, steel mm -hmm. on the bottom. So when they got ready to, a few pages back, when they got ready to ship them, we were over there that morning, and the guy had a torch, and he was taking and cutting them apart. And then they would hoist them up on. This is the uh, service they had that day, the dedication. I went and had Dora took a picture of me standing by one of them. And I also made the the uh, chosen magazine. Somebody sent it in. These are uh, these are just all things about Korea. Now here they are taking them apart. See the guy cutting the bottom. Mm -hmm. He's cutting the leg off. And then they would put a, a wire around the neck over here. You can see. And then they lift them up onto the flatbed truck. <clears throat> and they took them down to Washington D.C. Here they are loading them on the truck. They had a convoy that took them down. And I saved all clippings about everything, and I'm trying to find that. <clears throat> I went about. This is all about Bill Clinton. But I'm trying to find that card. I think it's in the other one. It was a Christmas card. <coughs> yeah, it's I in, remember uh, seeing a Christmas card. No, not now. I forgot. Oh, which. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to find out one about a star. What oh, we're okay. talking about? It might be. No, it's not in this one. Hang on, it's got to be. <coughs> this this is a very good article. This is a native of Korea honors those who save freedom. This is Dr. Kim, or Dr. Herbert Lee over here. He is a Marine, he come from Korea, and he had a dinner for more than uh, 50 Marines, I think it was, honey. And we went out to the party. It didn't cost me anything. He paid for it all. And they did an article on me, which I have, I'll show you. But he, uh, he's, He's such a guy. Now he's trying to raise money for the little Korean veterans over there that don't have anything. This is the part of Washington, D.C. All articles about Korea. This is one coming down out of the, the road, going back down into the safe area. But that's got to be. It's got to be in the street. Oh, uh oh, there's uh -oh. some water. Oh boy, I'm sorry. No, that's that's I don't right. want it on here hurting you. I'm here. sorry. No, that's fine. Oh. I, it's this I don't want. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. Can you turn that off? Yeah. I'm sorry. All right, I, I, back, I was worried about your albums. That's what I don't want damaged. Yeah, no, I know they're, they're so darn old, but. Ah. I'm worried. Oh, wait a minute. It's getting close. Here it is. <coughs> This is what th this pen stands for, the star. <clears throat> it's, there's a history of a place called Valley Forge, repeated on December at the Chosen Reservoir. And it has a story over Coterie, the star over Coterie. And then it is on a night of December 7th, 1950, in the snow-clad frozen mountains of central North Korea, in an area known as the Chosen Reservoir region. About 16,000 United Nations troops were in this remote, barren wilderness. The 1st Marine Division, a reinforced U.S. Army battalion, a Royal Marine Commando, and elements of the Republic of Korean Army, and some small supporting elements of the U.S. Army. These troops have been assured by the U.N. High Command that the Chinese Army faces, forces were not expected to attack across the Manchurian border, and that the troops could be expected to be on their way home by Christmas. Ten days earlier, an estimated 125,000 Chinese communist troops had poured across the Yalo River to attack the smaller UN force. Do you want me to continue? Sure, continue. Though not completely surprised, the UN force were almost overwhelmed by the tidal wave of the enemy troops, who cut the mostly American force into four segments, intending to digest the segments at their leisure. So critical was the situation that the UN High Command had written these units off as lost. However, these fighting men, and not knowing that all was lost, proceeded to fight their way 
doggedly through enemy lines and roadblocks until, determined and battered, they all joined together at the small village of Coterie, which guarded the entrance to the only road leading down the mountain. Our air support had been a major factor in the battle so far. Navy, Marine, and Air Force planes had helped battle the enemy during the daylight hours. But on December 7th, does that date ring a bell? A snowstorm began to blow widely around Coterie, and now air support was not available. The vastly superior Chinese forces were now in position to stop any further movement of the smaller UN force. Throughout that evening, many brave men, who had been fighting for 10 days in sub-zero weather, prayed that they might see a star appear to herald the end of the storm. Then before dawn, a star did appear to shine weakly at first and then more brightly. A shout went up from the, bat the throats of desperate men. There is a star. There is a star. Then there were more stars and more stars, as if God had pulled a celestial switch to brighten the skies over Coterie. Soon the snowstorm ceased and the skies cleared, and in the morning light our aircraft arrived on station to help these belligerent forces fight their way down the mountain road to safety. And that's what this represents. <clears throat> I also, I also received a few things I thought maybe you'd like to see. Our government has been very good. I just brought these to give to you. They're my cards I had printed up. Okay, and this is, um, I'm the Commandant of the Marine Corps in Newburgh, our chapter. And uh, I received two diplomas from the state of New York from Governor Pataki. And this one's this conspicuous service, state of New York, uh, and as actually the governor to John Kenneth Holmes, Staff Sergeant, U.S. Marine Corps. That was awarded to me, I got. And then there was another one. It's also state of New York, conspicuous service, is actually the governor, United States of America. And this is also from Governor Pataki. This came from the Orange County, Joseph A. Rampey, Orange County Executive. And this is also Orange County Certificate of President John K. Holm, August 2000, in recognition of your brave service to the country during the Korean War on the occasion of the 50th anniversary. I thought it was very nice. And then, of course, the last thing was, this is one of the articles that Yes, you sent us that article. We have that. Did I? You have this yes, one? Yes, sir. And then this is the latest one that I got from the school. And <coughs> when I went to see Tom Kerwin, who was the 96th District Representative for Operation Recognition, he thought it was a good idea to do something. So he asked me for some information, and I got him what I just showed you and some other things out of my album. And out of that, 21 more guys were there that day to get their diploma, and five of them I grew up and around where I was, was born, and I was so surprised, especially this guy, he was so emotional. But I'm in the back row, I can't be seen too much, but uh, you can have that copy if you like. Thank you very much. And that's about it, I think. I don't think I left me. Oh, oh. these are the two medals that came from from Pataki, conspicuous service, and then I don't know if you want to see them or not, but I thought it was very nice. Well, yes, you I'm going to put them in a. I'm going to put them in a, on a one of those plaques that they have. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do with them. I got the plaque, but I just have the ambition to to get them in. But uh, they're very nice from New York State. And that's about about it. I don't know what. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I'll um, get a copy. Um, you transcribed that. Yeah. Could we copy that? 
and put it in your folder? Uh, would you see it's all taped in? Would you rather oh. here? You want to keep that? That's I got another one at home. Uh, let, me, sure? let me see. Let me see if I can. Uh, where did I write it? Let's see. That's a second or third book. I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. I think this is the last book. If it's got a lot of pages in the back. No, it should be in here. I think they went in the Marine Corps with before. Let me see if I. Yeah, here he is here. This is the one I over here in this corner, Frank Crystal. We're this was in uh, over here in the, this one. where my thumb is. Uh, this was taken down in Paris Island, and it's Frank Crystal and I in boot camp in 1949, and that's me with the undress blues on the next picture over, right here. Right here. And this is what I was talking about: how the gooks would come up with the food, and. Uh, that's me getting ready to eat, and uh, Richie and Nick, and called Chow Line, Chow Call. These guys would carry these up on their backs, and then there would be hot food in there, and we'd get at least, at least about three things, and then hot coffee also. This is me here getting ready to go out, just getting my pack on my back, and we're getting ready to go out on a patrol. This time it was not no snow, this was probably the uh, first part before the snow came. But I know it's in here. It's just These are all the, my outfits. I saved everything, you know, and all the guys' names. I played softball on the team up in Scotia, New York. That's me here. And this is the captain over here. Whereabouts are you? I'm right over here where it says me. <laughs> <laughs> I was in shape then. Then I went to a wedding. One of our buddies got married. And uh, we held the uh, rifles, and that's me over here while he marched underneath her. And that's me aboard ship, the USS Wooster. This is uh, General Hart's last uh, visit, and he came aboard ship, and for some reason I was on the end, and just, we were just at a boot camp and everything. And uh, this is the fellow I told you about, got killed right alongside of me, Bob Taylor, his name was. Nice guy, he wanted to be a doctor. As soon as we landed in China, he got it. These are, I got a whole book of these home. These were the papers we got aboard the ship, USS Wooster. It was a light cruiser, and we got these papers, and I saved them. I took them home until my mother saved them for me. And I got the other album home with them all on. You can see how they're starting to do. So I just picked out a certain few. We had Elizabeth. And this is up in Scotia, New York. This fellow here right now is a retired colonel, <clears throat> and the family in Schenectady gave us a bulldog as our mascot. Wow. He's a retired colonel now, and he's running all these trips to Korea and all over. It's, uh, his name is Weeham. I met him about five years ago down in, in uh, Quantico, Virginia. And uh, let me see if I can, I'm still looking for that right up. You got time yet, or am I? Mm -hmm. No. Way. Boy, I gotta do something with this book. Where's that second book that he had? To... Oh, there's the green one, and the blue one is over there. That might be the one. I'm sorry. Huh. My wife's saying, get out. You said enough. Uh. Oh, this is terrible, honey. What are you doing? This is a diary of my Marine Corps life, whereabouts from day one, August the 9th, 1949, telling me when I joined the Marine Corps, went to Albany and then down to Paris Island, 
and then Camp Lejeune. Uh, and then we uh, left in May of 1950 aboard the USS Wooster. Ports of call I was at, uh, Italy, Genoa, France, uh, Gulf Juan, Port of Call, uh, Canes, Crete. And Are you still have the original diary? Uh, yes. And, and what did you keep it in? A little address book. A little address book? Mm -hmm. These are this is this is after okay, three days at sea and on the twenty first of September nineteen fifty made the Inchon landing. Now the rest is history. Now the only thing I can do if you want, I can take these out. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll cut them out, take them over to church, and make you a copy and mail it to you. Is that all right? Yeah, just at your convenience, because yeah. Well, what I got to do is just take a knife, and, right? Yeah. And I'll run them over to church, and I'll mail you a copy. Is that all right? Or is it going to be too? If, if that would be fine no, with I'll you. No, this this we tells me. We would greatly appreciate that, so you could we could keep that in your folder. Yeah. See, this tells me where I was, November twenty seventh, December, at which time we got surrounded with one hundred twenty thousand Chinese troops. Temperature 30 below, wind chill 100 degrees. We were 16,000 Marines, and it, like I went on. And then we left there, and we went to Maison for his, on the 16th. Stayed until the 13th of January, 19. From there, went aboard Japanese LST for Pohang, and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, set up a night at the bridge in the morning. Moved out to the Kansas line. Set up on the 8th and dug in good position. On the 10th, April 1951, I went to the battalion with four others and awarded the Bronze Star by Colonel Litzenberg. And uh, I got his picture, I know I do. I think this is the... We were out in San Diego two years ago. They had the 50th anniversary of the Korean War out in San Diego. My wife flew out and uh, we went out there and... Uh, it just happened to be that day. I didn't go. I didn't go to the uh, the meeting they had about the Cold War injury. Mm -hmm. We went shopping. Well, when I got back, the meeting was over, and uh, I walked over and I see all these guys signing books and everything. It should be in this one. Oh, you know what book that's in? That other one I made up, Colonel Litzenberg. There was a girl standing there, and she had a whole stack of pictures in front of her. I said, oh, that's Colonel Litzenberg. She says, yeah, that's my grandfather. I said, well, he pinned the bronze star on me on the 38th parallel. So she said, oh, yeah. So she said, give me one of the pictures. I gave it to her, and she signed her name on the back. She says, why don't you just wait in line after these other fellows get done? That's his son sitting there. He's a retired colonel. So I went over to him after I had my turn, and I said, Sir, I want to thank you, I said, for continuing on in the Marine Corps. I said, Your dad pinned a bronze star on me. And I said, he got up. We, we both got emotional, and it was so funny, you know. And he says, Thank you for what you did over there and everything. I said, Well, we just did our job. One year I was at a gas station in Newburgh getting gas, and a guy pulled up behind me. And I've got license plates out there, you know. And uh, he said to me, what are you, a, a cult? I said, no, I belong to a group called the Chosen Few. I said, we were survivors of the reservoir over in Korea in 1950. Made me mad. And then another guy got up, and one time he came over to me and says, thank you for serving our country. Makes you feel good. I got a license plate out there now. It says, I am a survivor of the Chosen Reservoir in Korea, 1950-53. Fellow had a maid when we were in Washington D.C. and I bought one off him, and I tried to send it into the Leatherneck magazine. We're going to put it in, the, but they never yet done it yet. So I'm going to try it again. And I've got American flags on the car and Marine Corps stickers and stuff like that. So very proud. I get emotional, very emotional at times. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> but the only thing is, when the Sentinel did my article, they did an article on me. They put ex-Marine, and I called him up, and I told him, I said, sir, I said, your girl made a mistake. I said, we're not ex-Marines, we're former Marines. So I crossed it off, and I put former onto it. But uh, 
I get I get emotional uh, the day of the graduation. The girl come over to me and says, "You're Mr. Holman." I said, "Yeah." She says, "Can I do an interview with with Tom Kerwin?" I'm waiting for that interview. I didn't get it was on local channel six, Time Warner, and I didn't have cable channel six, so I called him. They're supposed to make me a video. She says, "I chose you because my name is Holman." She was a photographer, or interviewer for. So they did a nice article there. People got to see it, and we saw it over my sister's on her television. It was very emotional, and then near the end I said, I'm sorry, I just can't talk no more. I never talked to my children when I got back, and after, you know, letting them, when they got a little older, I never said nothing much to them. And lately they've been reading some articles, and then the books, you know, they have. In fact, Dora, uh, a couple of books, Poussin to Chosen, she read, you know, and she didn't realize what we had gone through. So I'm glad there's still a few of us around that we can talk about mm -hmm. it. I want to go up to the school and talk to the kids in the 10th grade history class. Uh, they were at the ceremony in November, and every uh, one of the kids in the class signed a card, and they sent it to me. I thought it was very nice. So I took it to church the following Sunday, and I showed it to one of the girls. She's a teacher at North Junior High. She says, oh, I had this one here, and this one. She had four or five of the students that were in the... 10th grade history class now at uh, high school, so I thought maybe I'd go up one day and just talk to them a little bit, finishing school, get their education, and it means a lot to them, and then give them a book about Korea I got, a couple of articles they can put in their classroom or whatever, you know, so, yeah. Well, is that it? Yes, sir. We're all done, Thank huh? you very much. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.